to episode 8 of the Alfa Romeo Driver podcast. I'm Guy Swarbrick and today we're introducing a new format to the podcast. Every two months, between issues of Alfa Romeo Driver, we're going to have a panel discussion with club chairman John Griffiths, board member and Mito registrar David Faithful, and a special guest. We're slightly out on the timing for the first one because we wanted to take the opportunity to discuss Alfa Romeo's 110th anniversary celebrations this week. And joining us as our first guest is the owner of Auto Italia magazine and old friend of the club, Michael Ward. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. afternoon. We're going to start this afternoon with with an update from the club, John, if we could. Obviously, there's been some announcements over the last couple of days in in terms of the ever-changing regulations around what we can and can't do, and particularly a number of things that are coming in on the 4th of July, which is is not very far away now. As we are today, what's your thoughts on on how that will affect club activities and, and how we start to get things going again in the real world as opposed to our little virtual world? I think as I put in the last chairman's piece in the June magazine, we're kind of expecting all of the club's social and face-to-face activities to be very much led by section secretaries and local section organisation. And of course, we've got 29 of those to worry about right across the country and in Wales and Scotland too. So there's all kinds of complications at the moment as various things come out from the government briefings and broader advice. But locally, I'm expecting section secretaries to now be thinking about what they can do at over and above Zoom meetings, and I know a number have been holding those. I am one of the organisers for the East Midlands section, which is nice and active, and we've had a couple of successful Zoom meetings. Actually, we've got the second one tonight, so hopefully that will be successful as the first. But we're already looking at what can we do to get that face-to-face. Also this weekend, uh, I'm aware of two or three area groups having small runs out. In, indeed, there was a, an unofficial one in our section, a half a dozen enjoyed uh, a drive around some local lanes. I know that is going on in certain areas, and that's fine, as long as everybody's keeping to the guidance reg- regards the social distancing elements. So locally for sections, the majority of sections have pub meetings the end of the weekend or midweek. So we're looking now at when can we get those going again. I'm, I'm actually in communication at the moment with one of the pubs that our East Midlands group uses. It happens to have a big grass paddock adjacent but initially as i found out he's not open yet and he's not planning to immediately open because there's challenges around is it financially viable so this will be reflected i'm sure right across the country we're we're very much playing it by ear at the moment i think things will develop over the next fortnight or so pray to god there isn't a sudden second wave as people keep mentioning but one would hope that that sections can start to get a view as to what's going to happen this summer using pubs as their base uh, of course face to face and in meeting rooms that's really not going to be not going to be a good thing i know that the club's been planning to have another follow up section secretaries meeting as we did on zoom uh, back in march that's going to be planned for i believe we're working on the 3rd of july so only next week so the communication is going to be going out about that very soon to the section secretaries for that zoom meeting and this will be very high on the agenda as to how we you know, can look to restart things. Of course, apart from the, the, the section meetings and we're on to events, we had to cancel National Alpha Day in July, very sadly, at Vista Heritage, where we had a 1,000 cars together nearly last July. We had to get rid of that, unfortunately, uh, or we were going to suffer a financial loss had we postponed it and then it not been able to go ahead later this year. So we put that off to next year, but we have got plans to make a go of it with Southern Alpha Day this year down at Stoner Park, which is uh, close to the M40 north of London. That's got great access from all kinds of angles. Lo- lovely site, lovely venue too. So that could be a really good one. And convenient, we've got Michael here as well today. Uh, we're very much looking forward to supporting Auto Italia's planned events that kick off with the northern one in, in September. And then we've got, you know, one in the Midlands and of course good old Brooklands that was put off from May which everybody loves as, as an early year event. So we'll be very much behind those. And we're also looking at what we can do elsewise. Of course, the problem is we've got, you know, this pent up enthusiasm for some big events across the country, but we like it to have a very compressed window in which to do it. So we don't want to be overlapping everything. At the same time, we want to give people across the country a good opportunity to get together without having to trek for miles and miles, which is always the problem, of course. Yeah. And I, I should have said, obviously, that the um, the changes on the 4th of July apply to England, um, 
Very good point. Situation in Wales and Scotland slightly different. It is, yeah. So uh, these are all things that we've got to bear in mind. So we're going to come together with a secretary secretary's meeting for some, you know, instead of the board giving directions, we're going to have a collective view of things. And I would expect things to come out of that and us to constantly keep an eye on it and communicate as necessary. But uh, I think general club members listening to this want to know that we're on the case about things and we're going to do stuff as, as soon as possible. It's, it's really hard for a car club, especially one like ours, that, you know, it's got great local relationships with members and, you know, people love being being outside out with their cars and just generally meeting people it's fine you can go as far as you can with zoom but you can't be on face to face and i know you, we'll talk to michael about the auto italia event shortly but do you think there's likely to be because of so many organizations trying to do events in such a short window there's almost inevitably going to be more collaboration i know the cotswold section have been working with the bugatti owners club uh, around an event on i think the 12th of july at, at prescott where the Bugatti Owners Club have invited other owners clubs to go along for fish and chips or afternoon tea and a run up the hill. Do you think there's going to be more of that if, if we can't all find venues and things in the time available? Yeah, I'd, I'd very much hope for that. We Again, in my local area, we're quite, quite close with the Abarth Owners Club and we've got stuff planned for April, so we'll be picking that up again. And uh, yeah, you're dead right. It makes absolute sense, certainly in the Italian car community, to do things like that. So Cotswolds is a great example where you know, they're very close to Prescott with its Bugatti history. And you know, there'll be pockets like this across the country, I guarantee it, which is great. And in case we upset any of our French members, I do, we do know that Bugatti were French, but he's got Italian. <laughs> you're, you're very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, John. Michael, uh, good afternoon. Tell me a little bit about what you've been up to during the lockdown, because you've you've been managing to get a, a magazine out, as, as we have, and, and, and that's not been particularly easy tell me about some of the the challenges you've had over the last couple of months well we're in a privileged position where we're actually a small publisher um so both myself and my partner work from home so you know we we are social distancing anyway so we don't have any massive overheads we don't have lots of staff our editor uh, chris reese is freelance he lives in ascot and our publisher's uh, sorry, our printers are down in uh, St Albans, and all we do is uh, send them PDFs uh, over the internet. But I'm I'm very pleased and proud to say we simply haven't stopped publishing um, because we have a, a massive archive and backlog of features to go in the magazine anyway. So we always try and work two or three months ahead of ourselves. The one thing I personally have missed is actually doing photo shoots. Um, mm. I think I've done three since March, um, and that was one just just before lockdown and then too too recently when things have started to ease a bit so uh, for me not photographing cars has been quite a hard thing but on the publishing front it's been it's been quite challenging to get the magazine out there as in physically uh with the transport situation because uh, Barnes and Noble in the states they simply shut their doors so I have pallets of magazines thousands of magazines uh on a dockside somewhere that aren't going into shops at the moment, which is obviously quite frustrating. Um, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, sorry, South America, South Africa, in fact, uh, they all closed their doors as well. So it was very, very frustrating producing a magazine in print form for it not really to go anywhere. Obviously, with WA Smith closed, that was a double whammy. So again, um, I won't even scare myself with the figures of our first lockdown issue uh, because nobody could buy on the shelves. But luckily, we have a fantastic uh, and loyal subscriber database. And at the end of the day, um, those lovely people have paid for their magazine. And for me to stop publishing um, would be somewhat um, disloyal. So yeah, we've carried on publishing. I think the magazine looks better than ever. Um, we've always got fresh stuff to put in. So it's been slightly challenging, um, but rewarding in the same way. I've, we've had uh, comments from Australia, magazines are getting through now, and New Zealand have thanked us for carrying on publishing. And I know it's been very hard out there for the bigger boys, the Kelseys, the CHPs, and the, the Bowers of the world. I know there's at least three or four mag motoring magazines that simply won't come back. They have actually shut their doors for good, which is sad. Quite good for me because there's a little bit more shelf space as an independent, but it's a uh, it's a challenging time for everyone. And it's been challenging in both directions. I know we had a couple of things that we'd timed activity around with the last issue, and and moved everything forward so that we could deal with the postal delays. And then the post office, bless them, did everything ahead of time, and we ended up with the magazine out a week earlier than we'd been expecting, which then threw off all of our activities. But uh, 
You can't win them all. Well, indeed, the, the, the Postal Service has been somewhat unpredictable and somewhat unreliable, but you can't you can't knock that because it still exists. You know, we've had to replace quite a few magazines that have sort of gone walkabouts in the last few few months. Um, but no, the, the fact is, it still works. And uh, we're still sending stuff out there, which is a joy. And I assume, as we did, that you had plans for your next issue to cover whatever fantastic celebrations Alpha had put in place for the 110th anniversary, which were somewhat more muted than than I think we all hoped for. Yeah, there was, there was, there was going to be a lot more going on that actually happened. But we'd already planned... Uh, uh, if I look at the flat plan, because the magazine has gone to print, uh, if I've got it in, in the office here, I won't tease you with it because uh, it doesn't <laughs> go on, it doesn't go on for sale until uh, next week. I know the subscribers will have theirs by the weekend, but we've got 13 pages on the 110th year anniversary, so it's quite a bumper issue. We've got a lovely four-page interview with uh, the chap who does designs the GTA as well so it's a, it's a very alpha heavy issue but it's just a shame <clears throat> excuse me it's just a shame that we can't uh, promote uh, any of our events um you know because they simply aren't happening as, as you guys know and when we'll come on uh, as a group to talk about what what has happened with the anniversary but I think when the the GTA and GTA M were announced, they weren't quite making the same explicit links to the anniversary that they were by yesterday. So I think that's become a core part of of Alpha's celebrations is to launch the the GTA and GTA M. All very true. It's it's always good to celebrate your history, but if you actually have a new product to scream and shout about at the same time, it all ties in nicely, and it's a it's a fantastic car. And I do believe that somebody in the Maidenhead area has already already ordered one. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get our, our sticky little mitts on that sometime soon. There's been a few ordering them, uh, ordering GTAs, I know, uh, in the country already. Um, uh, one of the guys who works with our local section at a local dealership has got three down. But he also managed to sell some of the F1 edition uh, Julia's that we saw last summer that apparently none of those have landed yet, which is slightly worrying. Yeah, I, I think production on everything's been been restricted hasn't it and i suspect the limited edition stuff is those are the people who are likely to have been furloughed the people who are sticking on all the bits of carbon by hand and those that's kind of things it, yeah that, that's it but sauber engineering apparently they were all sat there um mm. literally literally sat at sauber yeah. so well if they were f1 employees then they'd have been they were forced to stop working weren't they for the duration yeah. by the pi right. mm-hmm. so apart from the gta gta m launch we also had the uh, the museum reopening yesterday to coincide with the anniversary I, I think probably all of us watched the the live stream from the museum yesterday any thoughts on the the live stream anything you saw that um, surprised you again i guess we've all been to the museum multiple times anything there that you hadn't seen before Go on, David. I know you and I were exchanging some instant messaging while we were watching it live. Yeah, I think, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I think there's some really positive things that came out of a, you know, pretty negative situation that we'll find ourselves in. So so I think, it, you know, huge congratulations to them to, for putting it on. I think there was some, you know, me personally, I was hoping for, you know, some teasers about Tanale or a, or a B segment car that wasn't forthcoming. But not a big surprise, you know, ideas that they had six months ago are probably very different ideas and completely different timescales now, even if they're ever going to make it into production. So I think there was some really good stuff. I felt it was a bit short. It felt a bit like, you know, the the F1 uh, commentators, the lady and the guy. um, um, Yeah, it felt a bit rushed, I thought, because there was a lot of running around uncovering uh, fabulous cars and seeing them for 10 seconds and then rushing on to the next thing so but I, you know it was a celebration rather than an announcement type day and I think had we been there and obviously a lot of local people were able to go there I imagine it would have been a fabulous day because all we saw was a, a tiny window into the event and actually I suspect being there would be something something very different. I know there were a couple of things you noticed in the background that perhaps the less observant of us didn't notice David. Well, of course, when when he went into the uh, um, Vansini is the the guy, isn't it? The Carlo Vansini. He was in the backstage there, and all I could do was fixate on the on the scale models of Mitos on the shelves in the back. So, you know, I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't resist that. But but you know, there were other things you know to see the Montreal prototype. You don't see that very often. The one six four Pro car. Michael's recently done an article on that. It's fabulous to see that you know in video. Um, and 
you know, I think there were some lost opportunities. So, um, you know, I think we could have focused on three or four cars and, and spent a few a few seconds longer on those rather than uncover eight cars and only have two seconds on each. But yeah. overwhelmingly, it was lovely to see the museum open, to be honest. That's, you know, if that's been closed up for ages um, and they've opened it up now, <clears throat> albeit by appointment and so on, and proper social distancing. Um, but yeah, it'd be fabulous to have that open and have people back into the museum walking through it. And some of the new exhibits sounded really good as well. Yeah, the Carabinieri one looks really good. I remember the Carabinieri displays at the 100th anniversary, the Centenario, when uh, they were all on display at the, at the second of the um, dis display areas that we had by the Milan Airport. That, that was fabulous. Uh, the, uh, the other couple of things that I really enjoyed yesterday was, yeah, it, it was kind of rushed, but it was almost felt to a degree off the cuff. I loved the interview with Art Mazzario when he was talking about the... 33 TT12 and and I know it was being translated by another Italian fellow who was doing his best but it, he was translating Art's comment about Alfa Romeo being the, the mother of all motor racing or motor racing cars which I thought was really good I've not kind of heard that language used before and good to see him with hat on as well Oh, his hat has to be on, doesn't it? Yeah, so many people will have seen him at the Goodwood Press of Speed over the years with his sets and on super. And um, the other one thing I liked was uh, Arno Leclerc, Mr. Leclerc, the boss of Alfa Romeo EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And he was referring to Alfa Romeos as creating cars, not building them. And I, I really like that phrase. <laughs> so, simple one, but not one that, 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 I've, that I've heard so often. Yeah, I, I think my only only disappointment is it's yet another trip to the museum, albeit a virtual one, where I've still failed to see the Sprint 6C. I was desperately hoping that that was one of the things that they were going to unveil. But but once again, I, I can almost guarantee that someone will post on Facebook next week to say that they've been and the Sprint 6C is out there. Cause that's John, it must, have, it must have driven you nuts, must it? That... that uh... That guy was touching every single car, wasn't he? Putting his fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, to have a bottle of quick detail of spray or something. Oh, and the swell marks on the back of some of them as well. Oh, no. <laughs> and the archivist must be uh, absolutely fuming that he's just fingering all of these documents. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, Enzo's, you know, contract of employment, and he's just fingering through them without gloves or anything. Oh, God. I'm dead to think what the archivists were shouting in the background. And of course, with Kimi Raikkonen as well, people <laughs> watched that back. That was never going to go well. A live interview with Kimi was just never going to work. And of course, you just need that little bit of break up in transmission. And that was all the excuse he needed, not to say anything at all. But I like, I liked that we had the, the vision of him on on the the link, just the top part of his body. We had visions of him surrounded by vodka bottles, you know, and to, <laughs> itch, itching to get away. <laughs> but it was great. It was nice to see um, Antonio Giovinazzi. Oh, sorry, Alfa Romeo Owners Club photo competition judge Antonio Giovinazzi. Um, <laughs> give a shout out to to owners around the world because I think a, a lot of it naturally was very Italian focused. But Antonio was was very keen to to bring the rest of us into the conversation. Yeah, that was great. And actually, the way they were cutting to the cars coming into the site, all the Alpisti that were, that were turning up in some amazing machinery was was great as well. That was well done. So I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it back on YouTube. I think it's tri been trimmed to about an hour or so, but but it's good fun. Again, I was let down that we didn't have the new the, any any exciting new models launched but uh, actually physically seeing a built gtan was positive <laughs> when they uncovered that um so that was really good and letting somebody drive it albeit only for what was it about 30 meters or so yeah that's right and we could just about hear its acroprovic exhaust as well which was great michael any any thoughts on the the event yeah I, well i think you pretty much covered it it was all slightly predictable and you know could have could have gone on a little bit longer but no it's uh, it's still nice to see that they're banging banging the drum after 100 10 years to be honest i mean i put a little thing on our facebook page yesterday and i was just going through our archive just trying to pick one model here and there and i ended up with 300 photos because we've done so many photo <laughs> shoots of individual cars i then had to whittle that down and that i still managed to post 130 individual cars uh, when i only wanted to do 110 so try, you, you can't choose your best and your favorite model sorry uh, yeah model of alfa romeo but they're just simply so many but um I'm, i've been to the museum many times when it was a, a dingy unair conditioned dungeon 20 years ago where 
literally... where you weren't sure whether you were in the right place the first time you went. Absolutely. And I've been where myself and my father were literally the only people in the building. <laughs> it was a cre creepy, dark place, and you'd stumble across a, a 33 iguana, and three of the tires were flat. Yeah. yeah, it was a fabulous place to be. And I'm, I'm just, I'm a hats off to them for investing so much in bringing it up to modern day standards. They could do it more exhibits, and it's fantastic that they've opened up the back office now. Because um, as you say, the six C Sprint, I've, I've seen that every time I've been there. But there are so many cars that people just simply don't know about. Like the Tipo 33 back end of the, the Junior, um, the JZ, Junior Zagato, with a snorkel on it. I think it's the Periscopo, they call it. But that's got a Tipo 33 back end in that and a two-litre longitudinal engine. Fascinating, fascinating stuff, which obviously due to lockdown, we, we personally couldn't go and see. When we photographed the 164 last year, we did actually get a personal tour uh, by the curator of the back office stuff. So we, we did the lifting of the red covers and there was lots of ums and ohs and gasps stumbling across the, the 164. Six GTA, the 156 GTA Stradale, the four-wheel drive 147 GTA, just wonderful stuff that we were feeding into photograph, and of course it all went wrong, sadly, but we will pick that up and get back to the museum when we can. So that's that's what Alpha did for the 110th anniversary, and I, I think, to be fair, you could have you could have forgiven them if they'd done nothing at all in the, the circumstances, and I, I think the, the story Alpha Romeo one minute video series that they put together on YouTube in the run up was also um you know nicely done and, and and a good introduction to the history of the mark. I'm interested to to know what your personal reflections are over the last hundred and and ten years. What do you think's the the most significant event in the history of Alfa Romeo over the last hundred and ten years? Or you know, one of the most personally significant for you perhaps? Well I think that they're two different things. So I think for me you know, if you think back over the entire history, the pre and slightly post-war racing experience with Alfa Romeo is just astonishing, really. So, you know, to if you if you imagine that that kind of environment was there today, where you had someone like Enzo Ferrari, you had drivers like Ascari, Nubilari, Fangio, and and they're all racing, you know, bright red Alfa Romeos, and they're winning, and they're winning, and they're winning. You know, it's 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 unthinkable, really, and it's kind of an era which um, <clears throat> my wife says I'm, I'm I must be much older than I actually am, but I, I sort of wish I was around in that era to see that happening. So I think you know, for me personally. I love that era. I love reading about it. <clears throat> I love uh, seeing pictures from that era. I think it's unbelievable, really. It's really, you know, for me as as someone who hasn't lived half of the 110 years, it's really hard to imagine that world. And so the pictures and the stories really bring it to life for me. But from a personal perspective, um, I'm bound to say it's the creation of the Alpha Sub and, and a joy that's personally brought me over you know from when I was a kid up until today and now I own another one of course like all um outstanding cars it's horribly flawed in a number of areas but but it's still my personal joy of of, of uh, Alfa Romeo's success certainly in my lifetime most of the flaws are great as well though, aren't they yeah <laughs> Just a wonderful car. I think that would probably be my personal highlight too, having owned a, a sudden a couple of, of sprints. I think from a <clears throat> from a historic perspective, I think the highlight for me is is probably the 105 coupes, which scarily are getting on for halfway through the 100 and, 110 year history. Mm. But if you look at the the club membership now, we've still got somewhere between half and two thirds of all club members own a 105 uh, of or at least one 105. Um, I think it changed the perception of the company. It was the first first thing approaching a volume car, although not in the the sense that some of the other uh, manufacturers have, have produced cars. Um, and I think it's as not as good today as it was the day it was launched, obviously. But it it's still an absolutely fantastic car with a yeah you know, an incredible following. And I think it's a an absolutely fundamental part of what Alfa Romeo is today. And and launching GTA and GTA M this year, referencing back to so the 105s, um, I think, just underlines that. Michael, what about you? I've always been a fan of the of the competition cars, I have to say. Um, obviously, I'm not old enough to, re to remember them from, from, from way back when. But going to events like the Silver Flag, Hill Climb, Grand Premio, Nuvolari, that kind of uh, event, you get to see Tipper 33s being driven on a public road, you know, like they were on the Targa Florio or Milamili back then. Um, and those those are my favorite cars are the competition cars i think um 
in the latest also Italia. My I think I go for the Tipo 33 Stradale as my ultimate all-time favourite. Um, and that's the prototype, not actually the, one of the 18 road-going Stradales. It's the prototype that I really do bang the drum about, I have to say. But no, I, I do love those 33 engines. It's the, the Martini ITC 155, the DTM 155, and the GTAMs. And I, I love those competition cars. I really do. I, I do like my road cars. They're, they're beautiful. Well, most Alphas are, are beautiful, as we know, all day long. But for me, the, the special cars are the competition cars, be it Auto Delta, Chitty, or even the earlier Formula One cars in that beautiful Martini livery or the, or the Brabham, whatever. I, I just, it is a competition cars that float my boat. There's no better feeling I can remember than having a, a red 155 in early 95 after Mr. Tarkini had battered everybody and driving into a race circuit with that, but with the black wheels and with, with my speed line stickers on them. Uh, oh my goodness, it was superb. But that, that all stemmed from me being an Alpha Submit and getting into those in the 1980s too. So I'm fully behind David on that one. I'm not the best person to ask this question because I've got to look in different ways of so many flipping Alphas anyway. But uh, I mean, I think some of that stems from me getting a Corgi Rockets Carabo in the early 1970s. And, and discovering then it was an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> but yeah, the, the racing cars are amazing. Um, I've always liked the latest car and what's coming just around the corner too. And seeing Alfa come up with the 8C Competizione in the noughties and suddenly going for this stunning supercar will gloss over the fact that there's bits of Ferrari and Maserati in it. But I mean, what a machine that was. And then for them to follow that through in bringing out the Julia in 2016, you know, into what a machine that is, and then having owned one for three years. Goodness me, seeing them coming back right to the fore again with a top class machine is tremendous. I just hope they can keep going, and uh, I hope they are allowed to continue to create cars and not just become a kind of say at creating very worthy cars based on another platform. Just to pick up on the, the Maxbox car, uh, come to Michael and David in a minute. Um, I, I can remember the moment I fell in love with Alfa Romeo like it was yesterday um, before the motor show. And it, I think it used to vary between the Daily Express and the Daily Mail, but one or the other would bring out a magazine in a couple of weeks before the London motor show, which was a, a, all the cars in the world. And they they were you know 16 to a page or something and there was a black alpha sud sprint outside a, a cafe uh, was the picture they had in there and I, I must have been i guess 11 or 12 and to me at the time you know whether it was an alpha or a ferrari or a maserati they were all kind of equally unreachable and, and i just i fell in love with that car and and pretty much every alpha i've ever seen since has just kind of given me the, the same feeling and and made me think back to that that moment David, can you remember when you fell in love with Alpha? Well, the story I always give is um, when I fell in love with the Sud. When a, a, I mean, I was just a kid, but I started as a trainee programmer, and and uh, and, a, and a colleague swapped his blue Hillman Imp for a beige Sud 1.2, and I've never seen anything like that in real life, and fell in love with it. I, but <clears throat> in terms of when I started to get a real interest in Alpha, um, I don't think I've ever said this before, but my brother, who's equally nerdy as me. For years and years when we were kids, he used to collect car brochures and he used to get he used to write really nice handwritten letters to all of the manufacturers. Um, <clears throat> and and lots of them completely ignored him and sent nothing and were just rude. Um, and Alfa Romeo always sent fabulous brochures to my brother. I remember being eight, nine, ten, something like that. Um, and he'd get a package through the door, and, and there's always a really thick package from Alfa with all these fabulous red cars and all these glorious brochures. And they just seemed really generous and nice people shared those brochures. And then me and my brother would flick through them. I'd just see all these this sort of sea of red, you know. All those brochures in the in the early sort of well, yeah, early 80s, I guess, and late 70s, they always had red alphas. There was no other colours really in the brochures. But yeah, I just remember flicking through. I don't remember a specific car that I fell in love with. I just loved red and I loved Alfa Romeo's and I thought they were just nice, generous people. Always, always sent loads of brochures to my brother. So and there's me and him, a couple of nerdy kids, and we both own alphas, well, four or five between us. And you know, if the people at Alpha HQ had just been rude or dismissive of these two kids we'd never have bought an alpha again so so yeah i think that's that's probably where my interest in alpha has sparked and i i mean i grew up in a <clears throat> in a household where we had a, a string of really horrible fords and Vauxhalls and bl cars but 
Michael, I think you've you've got a you've come from a an Italian car family, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't I didn't really have a choice. I have to say, my my passion is 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 from our history of owning cars. I have to say, we we were primarily a Fiat family uh, up up until actually around about the launch of the magazine. Uh, well, my father had a seventy five and bits of my lovely three liter seventy five. And one of the first Alphas I actually drove at the time uh, was a was a two liter one five five two liter twin spark. And it's that engine that definitely flicked my switch. Um, okay. And at that time, we we bought a brand new Alpha 145 globally, which is not everybody's favourite Alpha male. I'll, I'll, I'll put my hands up to that. But to drive that car, it was it was that engine. It was a brand new P-Reg car, and I mean, we I think we did 120,000 miles in that before before we sold it on to I think it was Roberto Jordan Lee Sunny who actually ended up with that car, and then it went on went on. But that car was absolutely thrashed from day one. It was because it wanted it. It drove well. Nothing went wrong with it. It never broke down, and that was a one and one hundred twenty thousand miles, and it was just absolutely perfect. The later ones in the one four seven, they just didn't seem to have the character uh, of that early twin spark. But just to um, to go back to the newer Alphas, uh, when we did the launch at a racing in two thousand fifteen of the Julia, I was lucky to be there when Andrea Bocelli sang the car into the auditorium. I don't know if you've seen the footage. Um, but it was absolutely fantastic. And as you can imagine, I've been on a few car launches over the years, but that's the one that sticks in the mind. It was so special because people were waiting for the Julia for so long. Yeah. And it literally wasn't until the day before that somebody had actually leaked a picture that most of us didn't know what it looked like. Genuinely, it was a launch we went to where we had no idea what the car actually looked like. And to see a QV driven in, to the soundtrack of Nessun Dorma by Andrea Bocelli was just startling. And that was, and that was five years ago. So, you know, in the scheme of things, the Julia's aging, but I still think I see a Misano blue one on the road today. I think still think it's a fantastic looking car. There's nothing on the road that looks like it. Yep, couldn't agree more. So that's where we've come from. Um, what would what would we like to see next? We'll, we'll come on to what we think we will see. Um, but but if, if you were running Alpha, what would be the priority for you as as the next car or group of cars you launched john i was interested that alpha launched pushing up market and going for a kind of three series and upwards standard saloon and then an equivalent to a, a kind of relatively top end suv and the Mito was allowed to poodle along behind it and they've extended and extended the life of the Giulietta, although that's going to go this year by accounts. I think most people would think we understand the concept of having a good profit margin in a more expensive vehicle, but also what about your entry-level machinery? So I'd be really keen to see a really good entry-level Alfa Romeo again, a brand new one. Ideally, probably not a jacked up SUV style or crossover. However, we know marketing's involved there and that's more than likely what we're going to get. But let's come back to what I'd like to see. So I'd like to see a really performance edged, small patchback. I'd love to see a small coupe and the Julia Coupe. The photographs from three years ago now, I think, that were, uh, sorry, the artist's impressions from three years ago in Car Magazine in particular, the Coupe Julia just blew the socks off everybody. It was magnificent. And it's like, why the heck didn't you make those? I know, I understand that the market for coupes is small and if not worse than that, shrinking. But come on, this is Alfa Romeo. They're not... They've never intended to sell, you know, millions and millions and millions of cars. So let's just be bloody good at hitting that market. So I'd really want to see that. Again, sport wagon always comes up whenever you talk to a Brit who's got a dog. They don't necessarily want an SUV. So let's have a Juliet, Juliet sport wagon. Um, that'd be fabulous. And then we need to think about propulsion as well going forward. Um, I'm hearing that there's going to be a maximum power per cubic capacity going forward. So I know Porsche are planning big naturally aspirated engines or bigger turbocharged engines just to get around that because there's going to be a limit as to what you can do. Uh, I don't know what Alfa Romeo are thinking about in that area. I know they've got a 1.5 Firefly engine come along, coming along that's going to be quite powerful with turbos, but there's a danger there that that will be restricted in what its power output is. So I guess we're going to have to see electric and hybrid powertrains coming in soon, and the PSA merge is certainly going to help with that. But um, 
back to personal, I'd love to see a coupe coming out. And a really, really good patch, a brilliant Julietta 2, and maybe a Mito 2-2. Two, 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 two. <laughs> That'd be tremendous. 2.2 litre Mito. That's it. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> David? Well, it, it won't be any surprise to, to hear that I'm keen that they replace the Mito, but <clears throat> not because I love the Mito and, and own some of them. It's... I've found over the last few years that, and maybe it's just an age thing, um, in the old days, I would just buy a bigger and better and a faster and a flashier car. Um, and, and I've completely changed. And a lot of the people who I know, many of whom are not Alfa Romeo fans, they're similar to me. They're going for these smaller, more compact cars that are just, they're just nippy and economical and still good on a motorway for the occasional trip. Um, they fit nicely in the smaller drives. We're all getting allocated these days. Um, so I think if you'd asked me two or three years ago, I'd have said, yeah, we need a replacement for the Mito because we need a, a small car co to encourage new owners. But I think the, I think it's the market's changing now and people's um, expectations are changing. So I probably wouldn't buy a Julia, um, but it's not for the reasons you think. It's because it'd be too big on my 1930s drive. It'd be, you know, it, it just, I, I like a small car now. So I think it's, you know, a meter replacement or a B segment uh, car, not necessarily an SUV, I think would encourage uh, new people to the brand. But I also, I'm convinced that there are old people like me who will remain with the brand and buy a new B segment car. I'm I'm in this position now where I have a newish B segment Alfa Romeo. Uh, unless they release a small car, I don't know what new Alfa Romeo I would buy now. I just wouldn't buy a Julia. Even the Julietta, I feel, is uh, unnecessarily long. So yeah, I think it, it's no surprise that I want to meet a meter replacement, um, but for odd reasons or not necessarily the reasons you might think. I do, however, absolutely adore the look of the new GTA and GTAM. I do think Alfa Romeo, like Ferrari, like Maserati. We do and should produce halo cards that wow the industry. We're not, despite any uh, mergers that might happen, we're just not one of the sort of run-of-the-mill standard, um, bog-standard car producers. We do want halo cars. We do want coupes. We want some, you know, if we're going to make a small car, my goodness, let's make a fabulous small car that absolutely blows the competition away and looks unbelievable. Only really Alfa Romeo can do that, I think. So I think, yeah, I think that's what I like. What will we get? I, I'm concerned that um, the Tonali will be pushed back, and that might be the only thing we have for five or six years. That's my sort of worst fear. I'm not saying the Tonali isn't good enough to be the only car we have for five years. If that's all we get, that's quite a good news story. But I think the, the pandemic and the subsequent economic problems in Italy and the rest of the world uh, might result in a, a sort of reining in of, of, um, uh, of some of the cool stuff but we'll have to see what happens in the coming months, I think. Michael? Um, I'm sort of on David's side there completely because I'm a fan of the Mito all day long, but I, I genuinely don't believe there's anything for the young drivers at an entry level. I really don't. I mean, the, the 1500 Firefly engine, that in a new Mito, I think would be fantastic. Um, I, I genuinely think the younger driver, um, I mean, that's why Abarth are doing so well because, I mean, the 500 is, is long in the tooth now, but there's not an awful lot else there to buy. And we all know most of the kids of today are on PCPs and financed up to the hilt, but that's how most people buy cars, to be honest. So there needs to be an entry level now for a Mayo. You know, yeah, I'd love an 1800 Turbo in a, in a, in a Mito. Thanks very much. But I don't think that'll be the, the reality of the situation. But on the flip side of that, I think um, we're crying out for an Alpha Spider. We really are. I mean, with the four C's come and gone, and whether you class that as an Alpha Spider, you know, that's up for, de up for debate. Um, but genuinely, a, a rear wheel drive, small end, small capacity Alpha Spider, something quality, something sexy. I think. I think the way forwards, you know, yes, it's going to be limited numbers. They always are, as far as uh, Italian market goes. But no, the entry level Mito and an Alpha Spider that just. You know, you can drive all, all, all in all weathers, but Israel will drive with a with a beautiful Italian engine. I think that's what I'd be looking for. And I think I, I agree with all of that. I think the, the the thing that surprised me with hindsight is I think probably the decision to make the the Mazda collaboration a Fiat was probably the right one. Um, yeah, it was always going to be an Alpha, and and then it wasn't. And I think I think that probably made sense with hindsight. Um, but to me, an Alfa Romeo model lineup without Spider and without a Coupe makes no sense. 
and and to have an aspiration to be head on comp- in competition with Audi, BMW, and Mercedes, and not to have a fast estate just makes that you talk about halo cars. The halo cars for all of those manufacturers is an estate, or one of the halo cars for BMW, but certainly for for Audi, yeah, you know, the RS events are yeah. the ultimate Audis, um, mm-hmm. and I think Alpha should be. Yeah, you know, doing similar thing. Okay, um, we talked about the merger a couple of times. Um, I start with with John because I know John follows it really closely. But things have gone pretty quiet for most of the last couple of months, and then there's been a flurry of articles in the last couple of days, isn't there? Yeah, there has been. Um, I do follow it through various online channels, and I've got a few contacts hither and thither that that, that pick up on snippets. But um, it, it looks like the merger is forging ahead now, and could could be all signed off sooner than we were originally thinking. Carlos Tavares is certainly a doer, the, the new boss of the entire group. You, you can actually see what's happening and has happened so well with Vauxhall Opal under his uh, guidance. And what I do like is that he's um, very much embracing all of the brands. Now, let's see if that continues. But I know Alfa Romeo is, as a brand is, you know, is superb. Let's just get some models behind it. But it, it, it appears that, the, uh, that it will go ahead. There's um, they're getting uh, an enormous loan lined up, something around 6.4 billion euros to forge ahead with uh, Italian production. There's plans going on at pace to get Casino converted. So the Giulietta's phased out and the new Maserati uh, mid-segment SUV starts being built. The, the money's been pumped into Pomigliano for the Tonali to be built and the new Pan being built in, in Italy. It's looking decent. Just picking up on one thing that PSA are doing, I don't know if people would know about the Vauxhall Mocha, which was a hideous, vile device, in my opinion. But they're just pushing the new one that's got the new uh, electric hybrid infrastructure underneath it with 200-mile range and 130 horsepower. It looks really good. This is a Vauxhall, for God's sake. Imagine letting the Italians loose on, you know, with that with that kind of remit to produce something good using decent underpinnings. Tremendous. I, I must admit, I look at what they've done with Vauxhall and I'm kind of in two minds in the sense that the Astra and the Corsa were so bad that yeah, you, yeah. you could pretty much have stuck a, a Vauxhall badge on a 208 and it would have been a massive improvement over what was there before. And to be fair, they've done a bit more than that. It really was starting from a very low base and and with a stock of cars that were already think, better to replace it, which I'm, I'm not sure is quite the same with, with Alpha. I think that's true across the piece. Um, the Peugeots were generally looking hideous. The Citroëns were quirky but bizarre. And and all of those are pushing on great with the, the very latest model design. So it's looking good. It's looking good. I'll talk to Michael in a second about the, the fit between all the Italian brands, because obviously Auto Italia is very close to, to the whole of the, the FCA group. But if you look at the the current PSA lineup, the one really obvious hole in their portfolio is in that Audi, BMW, Mercedes hole where Alfa Romeo fits. So whereas you look at some of the other brands that they're acquiring in the merger and you might think, well, maybe they can live with it in the way that they are doing with Vauxhall, but there's very definite overlap elsewhere in the portfolio. But Alfa doesn't really clash with anything that's already there. Yeah, I think I agree with you there. I'm I'm not one for kind of speculation about these things because I'm a believe it when I see it kind of person. And you see no end of renders of these new uh, models coming out. And that's all they are. They're just renders um, done by very clever schoolboys with great software. Um, you know, they attract an awful <laughs> lot of attention, but they're just simply not real. But I, I personally think the merger is, 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 a, is a super thing. Um, I think um, platform sharing, engine sharing, it is the way forward. Now, you know, I'll put my hand up. I'm not the world's biggest fan of electric vehicles, but I, I want to drive a tonight with all the electric powertrain in it. So I've got nothing wrong with that at all. But um, yeah, as far as where everything fits in the market, it's, um, as I say, I'm, I'm a suck it and see kind of person. So until I can see something in the metal, it's a... It's all a bit up in the air for me at the moment. Okay, so we're, we're coming to the end of the time. Um, Michael, we talked about the, the challenges of being in lockdown. We're starting to come out of, of that now. So what's next for Auto Italia? We talked about the events earlier on. Got a magazine just about to come up, come out. Um, what else is happening? Um, 
Well, going sort of to the events briefly, obviously we lost our Italian card here at Brooklands, um, which we postponed to the beginning of October, um, which is a sad thing to have to do after 30 whatever years we've been doing that event. But we never cancelled it. Uh, the only one we cancelled was a Supercar Day um, that was supposed to be in July. We postponed our northern Italian car day at Raby Castle. Um, and we're very much looking forward to um, doing that event. That, that is at uh, the beginning of September, that one. Um, Raby Castle is, an, is, a, is a fantastic venue. Um, it has had a few car events before. But, so we're doing a press day in a few weeks, so we'll get some free publicity out for that. Um, but no, I, I personally miss going to events, and it's fantastic that we've got the events in the calendars. Um, fingers crossed with a bit of sensibility from the general public, we'll actually be able to do these events um, without turning into Bournemouth Beach or any other silliness going on at the moment. But um, no, it's, uh, the magazine goes forward with never short of material. Uh, as I said earlier, we've got the magazine you know, ready ready to go. It'll be hitting the shelves next week. Um, always stuff to do. We did a fantastic shoot on one of the country's best 156 uh, GT, uh, GTA sport wagons this week. Um, and it was just stunning to hear that 3.2 engine. You know, I've, I've missed that for a while. We did a beautiful 1750 uh, Duetto racing car just uh, before lockdown. Um, that's, again, it's one of those lovely twin spark engines that you just want to hear. What else have we done that? Yeah, we did a, a brace of GTV6s as well. The, the Richard Melvin's South African green car and Johnny Horsfield's beautiful Alex Jupiter um, silver 2.0. 2.3, possibly 3D, I can't remember that. But no, we're, we're almost and upwards, to be honest. The magazine is always going to be Alpha Heavy because that's a fantastic market. And uh, with the support of Alpha Mayor Owners Club, we're looking forward to uh, seeing lots of shiny faces at our events and lots of very polished cars. Because I imagine <laughs> there's a lot of shiny cars out there not doing a lot. Absolutely. There is. And, and if anybody hasn't um, got around to polishing their car yet, and um, we've got a, an episode of the podcast on detailing coming up with um, with Mr. Griffiths. John, uh, what's what's the outlook for the club over the, the next couple of weeks, couple of months? As I kind of started with, we're looking to the, the sections, seeing how they can they can really open up with meetings again, uh, using pubs as, as the main base. Again, got to play that step by step. We've got Stoner Park, Southern Alpha Day lined up 13th of September. Again, as I said too, we'll be definitely supporting all of the Auto Tally events as we always have them. Personally, I'm really looking forward to good old Stamford Hall 27th of September which uh, was the scene of uh, what was it 18 National Alpha Days right up to the early noughties uh, it's only 10 miles from me can't wait for that one but hopefully this year I won't have to be on the trade gate at 6am for used to back in the day <laughs> so uh, I must say as well we've, there's been a load of effort put, put in by many people uh, you, you and David included I must say Guy uh, around getting the online operations running we've We've got the, the podcast series, we've got the race series using Assetto Corsa, we've got Zoom meetings going on. We've also just launched the archive online so club members can access, you know, five decades now of, of uh, club magazines way back to the 1960s, which takes some great perusing and can while away many an hour. So I think we've been doing what on earth we can and, uh, and it's great to see that the membership figures are bearing that up. We've been unable to sign people up at events for us, but the retention figures and actually the new joiners rate has been really satisfying. I think the one good thing that might come out of, that, out of all of this is that some of those things, the virtual race and the podcast, will continue once things are back to normal. So I think we've been forced to do some things that we've never had to do before, um, but there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't carry on and you know, add to the benefits we provide to members way beyond right. the end of this. That's right. And I think the Zoom meetings in particular would be really good to continue with over, over the winter months and when the snow's on the ground, if we ever get that again. I know we're already talking about, because we have a our December pub meeting is always a quiz. And the the worst part of the quiz is the handing round the the answer sheets for the person next to you to mark as everybody sits there and ticks yeah. and then adds up and then re adds up because they've That's got right. the numbers wrong. Um, so I think we're now talking about doing that in the pub, but using Kahit to do it even though we're in the pub. So we've got yeah, yeah. Kind of live scoring. So yeah, plug in a projector and off you go. That's Absolutely. a great idea. Yeah. 
Thanks everyone, and especially to Michael for taking the time to join us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the new roundtable format, and the panel will return in the middle of September with another special guest. But we'll hear from John and David again before then. Next week we have another special guest, as I spend a very pleasant half an hour chatting to TV's wheeler dealer Mike Brewer. Episode 9 will be available from 1.30pm next Sunday from all of your favourite podcasting sources, including Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and the club website. That's all for this week, so until then, stay safe. Stay safe.